you. I want to start um, by explaining how it came to be that we were doing this topic today. And, and really that was, I think, the Residential Care Initiative was looking to do palliative care at the end of life. And they reached out to Dr. Christine Jones, who's a well-known palliative care physician in our community, to do that topic. And uh, because she's involved in the project, thought this might be a really good opportunity to sort of broaden that perspective of what palliative care is from the final days um, to more of an integrated approach uh, within residential care as a whole, because that's really um, the quality improvement project that we're both uh, working on. Uh, so thank you. The division was and the, the initiative um, uh, seemed happy enough to have us, so we, we uh, thank them for that opportunity. And I would like to acknowledge that a lot of this work is not obviously done alone. There's a project team. And uh, so there's Dr. Christine Jones, who's one of our leads in Victoria, and Dr. Valerie Masuda, who's our lead um, up in Cowichan. And we also have two palliative link nurses, and one of them's here tonight, Jamie. Um, <laughs> there you go, Jamie. You're, you're famous. Um, and I also just want to acknowledge, I have no disclosures, but I do want to acknowledge that some of the slides um, uh, do come from other people, and they're um, credited. Um, and uh, that includes from uh, Dr. Mary Lou Kelly, who did work on integration of a palliative care approach in Ontario, and also Dr. Mike Carlos, who was uh, my residency program director in, in Winnipeg and is a very well-respected uh, palliative care physician in Winnipeg and, and really the founder of the Canadian Virtual Hospice. So there's definitely some of his slides here as well. Okay. So I want to start with a little bit of an exercise just to get people sort of warmed up a little bit. So for those of you that can read this, it says, don't freak out, it's just to save the date. So, because I want us to, to reflect on our own deaths for a minute. And, and that's maybe something, I don't know, um, people in healthcare do tend to do it. Certainly palliative care physicians, I think, uh, <laughs> think about it. Um, so just, just take a minute to think about what are you hopeful for for a good death? So maybe you can just pair up for a minute or maybe a group of three and, and just share. I would be curious to know, um, just have a chance to talk for 30 seconds or so about what kind of things you were thinking about. Were you thinking about the setting, um, what it would be like, what the trajectory was that you were dying over, what you were dying from, who's there at the time. Uh, perhaps it's thinking about MAID in this uh, period of people wanting control over their deaths. So just maybe turn to your neighbor and just have a chat about what a good death, what are you hopeful for for a good death? So I heard actually that I should have let that go a little bit longer, and, and perhaps. Uh, so it's interesting that people seem to engage and want to, want to talk about that. Um, I, I don't know exactly what the conversation is going to be about, but I'm assuming that a lot of words that came up would be the things we see in the literature around a good death. So things like dignity, perhaps things around privacy, uh, perhaps things around a home or home-like setting, um, being comfortable, not in pain, presumably, um, a sense of closure perhaps, a sense of a chance to say goodbye to people, uh, maybe a sense of life completion, um, and certainly that you would have, you'd have the care that you needed at that time. Is there anybody that really wants to, to say something about that? Was it a weird experience? Or have you done something like that before? Yep. I, I was just reflecting on my mother-in-law's uh, recent death <coughs> and uh, the aftermath of that passing away that was so problematic. And actually, if you look at this timeline here, it's not on the, on the uh, edge, it's the aftermath. And then the bereavement. Yeah. yeah. And so the aftermath has been quite interesting. Thank you for sharing that. That's a good point about how our death affects so many, so many people. So, yeah. So, certainly, um, I do know one of the scenarios that I don't think you would have been likely to choose, and and that was uh, this death. It, it did take care um, occur about ten years ago now, but it, it did um, receive some national attention in the news. 
um, after a gentleman from a Parksville care home um, was transferred to the Nanaimo Emerge and died um, in the emergency department. Um, and his daughter had been quite distraught because she had found him sort of alone and shivering in a, uh, a gown right you know, where the doors open and close as the ambulances come in. And he died seven, af seven hours after being there, never having seen um, a physician. So certainly I don't want to imply that this is the norm in residential care by no means and I certainly don't want to imply that he wasn't given very good care and that people were looking after his best interests, I'm quite sure. But I think there's some systems things that were learned, um, I know there were from this event and I think this is really what I'm getting at today, what are the system changes that can help um, plan good deaths. And so actually what came out of this is there was work done in the Nanaimo hospital um, around triaging in the emergency department about what, what is important. And um, also the residential care end of life order sets were sort of sparked by this case, I was told as well. Um, so we do learn. And so really today, what I want to talk about is what a palliative approach to care is. And I think it really comes down to that. It's around the planning that's needed to avoid um, deaths like we just um, discussed there on the, on the previous death and get to the good deaths that we want to have. So I will be talking about what a palliative care approach is, why is it re relevant to the um, residential care setting, and I'm going to provide some data from Island Health to try to help um, bring that alive to you, that this is really relevant to this population, which I'm sure you know anyways, but I think sometimes it is interesting to see some of the data. And um, what are some of the potential benefits about integrating this more into a systems of care? Um, and how does it relate to the residential care initiative best practices? Um, and then I'm also going to talk about the uh, quality improvement pilot project that we're doing because I think it really has some very practical ways that it can be integrated into the system. So again, it's really not about, uh, I think when we, when we hear about this, we're going to say, yes, I, we do this, of course, that's best care. It's around patient-centered care and resident care, of course we're doing this. But I think the question is, at the systems level, could we integrate it more? Okay, so, so what is a palliative care approach? Um, it's Just to save your neck? Yes. Should be I could. Up right there. Thank you. That so makes you much more sense. So much. Thank you. No um, so an approach intended to improve quality of living and dying for residents with life limiting conditions and their families, as you speak to about the bereavement issue for sure and, and while they're living as well. So it really borrows from practices from palliative care and tries to adapt it to this um, to different settings. And so, but pieces of those important um, principles are early identification, who can help. We can't plan and we can't prepare people if we only know two days before they're dying or if we only talk about that they're dying two days before. So it is around um, stretching what we understand as that um, dying trajectory. And then of course advanced care planning and goals of care conversations and of course assessment and treatment of physical, psychosocial and spiritual concerns. Um, palliative care has always tried to look at the whole person, holistic um, care. And I think it was quite fitting that, of course, we heard about pain assessment in the first. Um, that would be, of course, important as we look to integrating a palliative approach. So I think what we found as we were starting to work in, the, um, in our pilot sites is, again, one, there's a sense, rightly so, that this is happening. But the terms are different sometimes, too. Um, so palliative care within residential is often used to refer to those final days of life. Um, and really we're saying palliative care um, is not and, and can be integrated earlier. So this is one of the uh, graphics done by Dr. Mary Lou Kelly, as I said, who um, is in Ontario and through Lakehead University. And this is specific to residential care. So that sense that um, it can be done at the same time as restorative care, but that over time you're probably um, more of the palliative approach is relevant as, as time progresses. I think, and, and this one does have bereavement on it, as, as it rightly should. Um, I think it's important to notice, too, that they don't necessarily have to be admitted at stage one, right? They might be coming to residential care um, already at stage four or five, 
We, we actually transfer people from hospice sometimes when their um, prognosis is longer than the six weeks that we can keep them at hospice, but we still might know very well that they only have a few weeks, a few months. Um, they wouldn't be transferred with a few weeks, but short, short months they might have. So it's around, even at the time of admission and assessment, where, where are they at with this? Um, so, of course, one of the challenging things about integrating a palliative approach in the non-cancer diagnosis is that, well, when is the right time? Where you're saying, don't wait two days before, but when is the right time? Because we know those trajectories are challenging. With those organ system failures, um, you know, any one of those dips from that COPD exacerbation or that um, CHF exacerbation might be their last time. But they might get better from hospitalization, would they? You know, so. So that is the, uh, the challenge. And then there's the dementia um, for ALT and decline uh, trajectory, which is also um, challenging to know when is the right time. But we really don't want to let prognostic um, uncertainty um, stop us from integrating an approach. Because a lot of the things can apply to everybody. Talking about your goals of care um, is really for everybody. So we are really, in this project, trying to identify those people that are in, that we would not be surprised if they died in the next six months. We thought that was maybe um, a good target to move towards, to back up that sense of when palliative care could be uh, integrated. So that's what we're going for. And there's tools out there, well, we'll get to that, um, but trying to help us identify people with advanced diseases when that would be. But certainly, even the surprise question has been validated to some extent using that, would you be surprised if they died in the next six months, 12 months? So then that's the right time. OK, so I said I was going to try to um, explain why we're thinking that this is so important in this population at this point. And one is this is where people are dying now. So in Island Health, almost 30% of people die in residential care. Uh, the province is 25%, so we're a little bit higher. But I think that's because we have a lot less hospice beds than other health authorities. Um, and still upwards of 40% of people dying in acute care. So there is a little bit of that paradox going on when you talk to most people about what that good death is, and they sort of envision this home-like setting. And yet, there is quite a medicalization of, of dying and, and of death. Okay. So as far as um, how long someone stays in residential care, the average length of stay is now um, about 14 months in Island Health. It's shorter than a lot of the other health authorities. Um, people tend to. The criteria are pretty strict to get in, and uh, people tend to be supported at home a little bit longer. So this is showing that about 30, well not about, 38% in 2014, I believe the state is from, um, died in less than a year. And then with the, um, the, the less and less of, of longer. I think too you're seeing it shortening more and more every year because it used to be that the criteria were less strict, I guess I can say that. People went with less comorbidities, less frailty. Um, I was told people used to have parking spaces in residential care. <laughs> That's not the case anymore. You wouldn't be driving and be in residential care. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so when we look at um, that, for, that cohort of people that die in the first year, that 38%, we also see that quite a few of them die very quickly. So um, upwards around 18% of them die within the first month. And overall, if you look at that dark green total for less than three months, it's actually about 17% of all admissions die in less than three months. So I'm not the first person to note that really the hospice population and the long-term care population are merging, really. Yes. Um, <coughs> it's just the complex care beds. This data was taken from not assisted living or, yeah, it has to be one of the complex care beds. Okay. And not private. I think this is all the owned and operator affiliate beds. Because that's what we have data on. Um, so I was saying that this is important because this is the population 
that is in these beds. I'm also saying it's important because this is actually a priority of the Ministry of Health. So there was a provincial end of life care action plan um, done in 2013. And under priority one, which was to redesign health services to deliver timely coordinated end of life care, one of those actions was to improve the capacity to provide quality end of life care in residential care settings. It's um, been a priority in other jurisdictions, so this isn't something that's just happening here. Um, Australia's really led the way, I think. Um, they develop guidelines for a palliative approach in re residential aged care, as they call it, back in 2006. And that was um, a program that was sort of their national health services did that. Um, I already mentioned the work um, happening with Dr. Uh, Mary Lou Kelly out of um, Lakehead University, and, and they're integrating her work into a lot of the Ontario um, residential care sites, so they call it long-term care. And there's also in the UK the gold standards framework, which was um, sort of the standards for palliative care, and they developed standards for care homes. And I should point out, actually, there's also things happening in our own province, um, including at Providence. So um, w with Dr. Gallagher's team, that was one of the, the people I talked to because they had the, the link nurses, the palliative link nurses that are attached to the, to the residential care sites there. Um, and there's also the DAISY project in North Van. And um, yeah, so there's, there's a lot of work happening in this area, I think, as we recognize that population. So I do think it's worth noting, um, and it has been commented by uh, Dr. Tom Bailey, who's medical director of residential, um, and he is one of the advisors on this project, um, that how well it merges with the residential care initiative um, best practices. Because as, um, like one of the challenges I say has been in providing that good quality end of life care are some of the structural things around residential care and access to physicians. Um, uh, being on call, um, how often they visit, etc. So as that becomes, um, as that changes a little bit, it'll probably be easier. I think the meaningful medication reviews, I was very impressed with the work that I saw out of the shared care group, really integrating goals of care into that when we're looking at what does a meaningful medication review mean. If you don't know what the goals of care are, how can you decide which medications are appropriate. Um, completed documentation, I mean, that has to include the advanced care planning piece. Is the most completed? Is, is there, um, are we documenting the conversations we have? And really, a lot of the system level outcomes that they have identified are the same as for this project, as would make sense. So how do we, getting into that then, the quality indicators, how do we measure how we're doing in something like this? Well, if we go back to that diagram of integrating a palliative care approach, if we've integrated it early enough and we're prepared, then as things become closer to the time of death, um, things should be more focused on um, a palliative or comfort care approach. And so you would imagine uh, that we would be avoiding hospitalizations, eMERGE visits in the final weeks or a few months of life. So that's really what we were going to use as proxy measures. So where were we starting from? So um, we looked at the data in, um, for Island Health. This is also 2014. For those living in residential care for their last three months of life. So it was about 2,000 deaths in 2014. 10% of people, so about 200, died in acute care. About 20% required an admission in their last three months of life, so that'd be about 400 admissions. And um, no, sorry, not necessarily 400 admissions, 400 people required admission. Some of them required more than one. And then 27% required an emergency department uh, visit. We looked um, at why they're hospitalized, and um, so we were looking at that coding that's done afterwards, uh, the, the data people pulled this out. So the biggest category was other, but when they sort of looked more deeply into that, 88% of those others were for palliative care reasons. So they weren't necessarily recognizing that they were dying at the time that they were transferred, 
but that was the reason that was given retrospectively for why they were in hospital. And then another big category was um, pneumonia and COPD. I'm going to skip this one, actually. Um, so then more specifically, we looked at our four pilot sites and wanted to look at the emergency department visits and hospitalizations in the 90 days prior to death at those sites. So along the y-axis is the four sites. And in brackets, there is just the total number of deaths that they had in that one year. So they had slightly varying diff numbers. That's just based on their bed size, usually. So this is what we found interesting, because I think it begs a lot of questions and maybe room for, for learning. Um, that, so the, the blue at the bottom is what percentage of people didn't need any eMERGE visits at all in the last three months of life. So at two of the sites, about three quarters of them didn't. But at one of the sites, it was over half of them required. And 20% required too. Um, and then there was one that was sort of in the middle of that. So the sites were chosen um, because they had different uh, models. Some of them were affiliates, some of them were owned and operated. They probably have different staffing models, they might have different physician models. So I guess, how can we learn from the best practices of some of the ones that maybe um, are showing less transfers and we're assuming higher quality of care than by that proxy measure? Um, and what can we learn from, from them? There could be other things too. There could have different, slightly different populations of people. Uh, so there, there may be other things. And this is similar, um, but this was for the admissions. So very similar data. Okay, so coming to the, the pilot project that we're doing, um, as I mentioned, we have four sites in three geographical regions. So there's two in Victoria, one in the Cowichan area, one in the Parksville area. We were able to hire two part-time palliative link nurses that are in the sites on a regular basis, um, sort of building capacity there. Um, and they're also working with our team that includes two lead physicians in the areas to help um, really look for system change opportunities. Um, we really are trying to come alongside our residential care partners and say, you know, you are definitely the experts in, in residential care. We have some palliative care learnings. Um, wh what can we share? Some of the things that we've been able to do so far are um, do some LEAP. So LEAP is through Pallium Canada. It's a national organization uh, with very well-respected curriculum, and they have a module on lo um, long-term care facilities. So we were able to do that in sort of a team, so having a group of nurses, um, some physicians, uh, social work, um, care aides uh, from the site. So we'd have two sites at a time. And, and it was really good team building and um, learning opportunity. Uh, most of the sites, I think, um, the, the link nurses have been um, able to institute, I guess, or but this is something that is, is a joint project. So it's not like we're going in there and saying, let's do this. It's around collaboratively what we would do. And so, um, you know, again, collaboratively, they, there was decisions around doing palliative care rounds once monthly or something like that in, in a number of the sites. And that's helped as we talked about some of the further things that have come out of that. And we're looking for champions, really. So it can be sustainable after the project is over. So one of the things we're doing to try to um, help with sustainability is try to develop a little bit of a toolkit of what could be helpful in integrating a palliative care approach in other sites. So we did develop, and you guys have a small copy of this, and I apologize for it. I know it is small writing. Um, it was really, it's meant to be a big poster size, and we've printed out um, qu quite large poster size for all the different um, nursing units within each facility. So each facility would maybe have 15 of these or whatever um, up in different areas, and areas where they do rounds, that sort of thing. So it's really to try to give a visual representation of our concept of what this means to integrate a palliative care approach, really focusing on identification of transition time as being really key and critical to uh, identify and then to communicate not only with the family and the resident, um, but also with the team itself. Because that's what we were hearing a lot of times is that 
oh yeah, the nurses are aware of this, or the care aides. Often it was the care aides. No, they're in there every day. They see those changes, but that information doesn't necessarily flow up the chain to the nurse, to the physician. Um, and so some of this was really around empowering those people that are there, um, doing that day-to-day -day work with, with um, the residents. So we did, we tried to put the signs of the transitions that you might see, and that will um, tie into some of the other tools that you'll see. So again, the focus on taking what palliative care means from that active dying time, that PPS of 10 to 20 percent, that prognosis of days, and backing it up to when we're seeing, no, this person has months, but they're also very frail, have multiple issues, and actually, we wouldn't be surprised if they died next week in some ways. We're talking about them having months, but they are also that frail that things could change. And that's a piece that sometimes also doesn't get communicated, I think, um, to families always, that that more sudden changes can happen as well. Yep. So how would you make, how would you advise us to make use of this? Make, let's make it practical. Yes, thank you. I didn't, didn't um, pay you to say that, but great. So what we did, what, some of the other tools, so, so they've had this knowledge, they've, they've learned these things, they now have it sort of there front and center to help remind them. But now we have one of the, well, I didn't include the identification sheet, but um, so there is this palliative approach to care early identification tool. You will see it sort of summarized on the letter to the physician, so that's why I didn't waste paper and print out another one of these. But this sheet is printed in green and is available in the pilot sites so that when they do see those changes that, as we said, are often sort of, um, the nurses always knew. If you ask them, who do you think is going to die in the next six to a month, they'll know. But this sort of justifies the reasons and helps them communicate. And it also, by having that green sheet on the chart, identified, helps identify for the rest of the team where everybody thinks things are at. And I think in a lot of cases, the decision to do this is happening at palliative care rounds or perhaps at a care conference. Okay, So it's green, goes on the sheet as a visual tool. When? When do I get the green So once you've made that, once you guys have made that identification as a team. So you've seen changes, you bring it to, maybe you're concerned as one of the staff members, you bring it, you say, I would like to discuss this patient at palliative rounds. Or, because remember that care conferences are only really scheduled yearly, once a year. And they're supposed to happen also if there's changes, right? But if we know that 38% of people are dying in a year, you can't wait for a care conference to change that, right? So what we're trying to get is, if you see these things, if, if the person has just had an, um, a hospitalization and things are different, then bring that to the attention. Say, let's talk about this person at Palliative Rounds and make that decision. Okay. I think this is what we're still learning. What's that? What if you don't have Palliative Well, I'm, yes. Well, then maybe you need to start. I don't know. <laughs> no, um, I, I think this is what we're learning in our pilot is how is this going to work? Because we can't add more work. We can't add more checklists. This has to be integrated into their normal daily practice. Hopefully, we're giving them something valuable that they'll want to use. And I guess maybe after, or do you want to say something now, Jamie? <laughs> yeah. um, well, we had to get people used to it, to using the identification tool, we had started with, um, with care conferences, so um, like at Mount Ptolemy, who they've been really embracing it, it was, okay, who's our care conferences next week? Let's screen those people, let's go through, were there any changes? Um, and everybody really seemed to buy into it quite well, it was easy, it was quick, um, just the identification. And now it's, it's really trying to empower those champions um, Leadership that can go around and sort of say, talk, you know, like maybe stop a carry and say, you know, is there anybody that you're concerned about right now? Is you know, is there anyone changing? And it's it's amazing how often you talk to a nurse and they say, oh no, he's fine, and the carry's like, no, he hasn't eaten in two days. Um, so really trying to and so that really drives it home that it's a team approach. Um, so it's it's happening more a little on the fly. The who's just having a change now or who's just been slowly changing or I'm not really sure, let's get on the checklist and see. Um, so the identification part is going really well. Um, and 
but the biggest hurdle, as to be expected, was what comes next, and that's like the conversations with family. Yeah. Um, I think I think what I hear you asking, Ian, is is what's the value added right now? Is that what you're asking? How how might what might we integrate this information and take it away and use it? Yes. Yes. Okay. So um, I, can you go back to the identification tools for a second? And so one of the things I wanted to say about this is that every one of these little picky boxes, we didn't just throw that up there. That is from uh, excellent research, gold standards framework. You can see um, a, a reference at the bottom, as well as the palliative care indicators tool, which you'll see on the back of the um, uh, plan P forms. So every single one of those picky boxes is based in research. And so while this, this is developed for the pilot, and we're trying to get feedback to improve. You know, it's a quality improvement project. So what we're not saying is that, okay, everybody, go away and take this to your residential care facilities and use it now. Because this is in the pilot project stage. We would love feedback. That's where, because it's an iterative thing, we want to change it. But what I think you could use it for now, in this moment, is to go, okay, these are things that are well-based in research that Leah and her team has identified. And maybe I can take this and look at some of my own patients. And then there's the so what, which is what Jamie was saying. So we've identified them. So then what do we do? What is the palliative approach? And I think Leah's going to talk about that. But what we have learned through talking tri much trial and error is the, the biggest so what here, and you guys can go, Christine always talks about this for all the time, <coughs> is the conversation. Is a conversation that ensues to then talk about what's coming next and what's important. So anyway, sorry. Now, I do want to hijack, but I wanted. I think that's what I heard from you. Oh, like, and yeah. Leah, um, just another really big like um, plus that's come out of this is I've had nursing staff say, "Well, yeah, they have dementia and they're total care, but I mean, it's not like you can die from that." So it's been this huge piece of educational. People do die from dementia, and they're like, "No," but I mean, it's just their mind. They're healthy otherwise. So it has been really good to put it. Just it, it's like no, that's got the same value as somebody with an advanced cancer diagnosis, COPD, heart failure, you know, and this is their brain failing. So that's and even you know like the weight loss, um, saying that even if that was the only one that we ticked off, that would indicate for us they're at a higher risk of dying. Mm -hmm. um, so that's really been nice to be able to put that value on those things that we take for granted. Thank you. Can you connect this to the color proposal sheet that you just talked about with all the name columns? Yes, because uh, these are. So we go back. Oh. Um, that first line where it's, and there's that square that says, ask yourself, would you be surprised if this resident died in the next six months? And then it comes down and it gives those signs of transition. Those are also basically a summary of that sheet. Okay? And then do something that I should do, right? Yes. Okay, so we do, and I didn't include this one either because I can only um, justify cutting down so many trees for this, but um, we did create a, this is for the nurses, this is for the charting, um, a, a guide for goals of care. So we really wanted to answer that question, so what? Okay, we've put the identification tool on, now what are we going to do? And really, it, it's where we're at in the project, so it's around letting the rest of the team know, sending a letter to the physician, which you do have a copy of. Um, to form them of where you're, what you're seeing, and starting the process of information sharing with the family. And as Christine said, we're really identifying that this is what they have wanted. Um, you know, we came in thinking, oh, maybe we're going to do stuff around um, symptom management. They're actually pretty good around that. They have guidelines. There are, there are other people working on that. But it was the conversation piece with their, where they're still asking for help and, and, and thirsty for role play, practicing, that kind of thing. So that has been um, a pause. And also they were looking for that um, empowerment that they were allowed to start these conversations. Oh, no, this has to wait for the, for the physician. No, actually, you are see this is not around giving somebody a diagnosis or even a prognosis. This is around bringing starting that conversation about the changes that they've seen. Have you seen this? You know, starting that and then leading them towards the physician, especially when they see that 
the goals of care might not fit with what they're seeing. So if they're seeing somebody in their final months of life and they're still at um, an M3 and wanting hospitalizations and thing, they're thinking, there's a little bit of an imbalance here. Let's redirect them to the family physician so that they can re-engage in that conversation. Okay? So I guess physicians who are um, have patients at or residents at our pilot sites may start to get that letter that you have a copy of. And it was really just sort of a um, to let you know, and maybe you want to come in and assess and talk to them, reevaluate the most appropriate. Um, so I've got that up here too. Oh, I skipped this one though. We'll get to the physician letter in a minute. Oh no, so this was the conversation guide and I did give you a copy of that. This is the one for nurses and social workers. And it was really around looking at what their scope is and working within that scope. This one's prettier than the physician one that I'll get to later because this one's a bit more finalized and in use. The draft one for physicians is still draft. Okay. So, and as I said, this is the letter to the physician that will go out once a patient is, a resident is identified. And it, it kind of also gives that summary of why the care team thought that they were in that more high risk of dying category, what the current medical orders for scope of treatment, so you quickly know. Um, and then it lists what we're hoping to do with this work around what are the benefits of a palliative approach. Okay. Yes. Do you want to take a second? the physicians of the room. How would you feel about receiving this letter? Straight out. You're in your office, you've got an hour of taxes and incomes. Your doctor back here, you need to identify those facts and high risk of dying. They have these things. They're the most. I'd be thrilled. Maybe someone's going to come. Maybe someone's going to come. That's what we're trying to do. Any other ideas? Feelings that you get? Physicians in the room? Just checking. So, there's more than one nurse point, I think, for this before. Yes. Yes, this is a team approach. It's not like one person. Yeah. Just like Remain's story about the residents who said the person was dying. Yeah. Yeah. Or has anyone received a letter from the pilot sites? Uh, Mount Tell Me in Selkirk down here. Selkirk. Mm -hmm. I know some people here have got them. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I think, as, as Christine and I have both already said, we really are seeing that the, um, the high priority in this is around communication, and you, you really can never do it enough. Um, the single biggest problem in communication is the illusion that has taken place, and I think I see this all the time in my work. I had a, a case just recently where um, a woman, she was only 75 actually, but very cachectic, failure to thrive, hadn't seen a physician for 20 years, was brought in. They started the workup about why she was just failing quite quickly. She was all of a sudden PPS 30%, couldn't get out of bed, uh, was hardly eating, was sleeping all the time. Um, they found some abnormalities in her colon, her endometrial thickness was high, she was very anemic. Um, but the family said, you know what, further workup. They, they talked to GI, we don't need further workup. They're not recommending it really giving her frailty. We know she wouldn't want that. Um, yeah, and so I w the referral came in for delirium and also to talk to them about comfort care options. So I wasn't quite clear on what it was they were looking for me as a hospice physician. So I went to the hospitalist, I went to the nurse, so I'm like, so they know she's dying and they just want to talk to me about hospice. Oh yeah, yeah, they, that's what they want, comfort care. So I went and talked to them and we talked to the big family. And I ask them, as we suggest, you know, where are you at? What do you understand about what's been happening? Okay, so they told me the whole story of what had been happening. And then I said, so it seems given the goals of care, what's the, her condition and the fact that we're not going to be investigating more, you know, she's dying. And, and they all kind of looked at each other, oh, she's dying. And that had not been said. So comfort care, they knew. But she was still on IV. I mean, they didn't, they, it wasn't that they totally didn't get that, but they hadn't said the words out loud. And when I asked things like, 
does she have any important religious or cultural things that we need to know about? And they all looked at, well, we haven't talked about that as a family. We haven't really started talking about her dying. We're just at the place where we're talking about comfort. We're not going to do any more investigations. So you can't, I guess what I'm saying is you can't take anything for granted. Um, and so I, I think it must be hard when you're coming on sometimes as a locum position or you're taking over somebody, you know, you feel, we all know the stats about residential care, people, I mean, severe dementia, they must know where things are at. And a lot of times they don't. And that's why you really have to ask what their understanding is of things and start there. So, um, oh yeah. But sometimes these conversations are like the elephant in the room. And so hopefully, some, isn't that magic? <laughs> um, some of these things can help take away uh, that elephant in the room. I probably won't have time to go through all this, but just some research that backs this up. What matters most in end-of-life care? Perceptions of seriously ill patients and their families. And lots of good learnings here. I always find this interesting that trust in the doctor is number one. We, we can't, um, it should be humbling really, shouldn't it? Um, Number three, that information about your family member's disease be communicated to you by the doctor in an honest manner. And that is so important. We so often don't really talk about prognosis. And I think that's why, again, with these tools, we're hoping that if we can start framing things in terms of, you know, months, not years, weeks, not months, that that will be helpful. Because you can't make good decisions about uh, care, about hospitalization, things like that, if you really don't have a sense of that prognosis. So I won't go through all the rest of them, but you can have a look at some point. Um, yeah. Uh, so coming back to here, um, I think I just wanted to bring some um, of my sort of, well, we created in draft a physician because we thought, okay, now we're directing the, the, the nursing staff to direct the family back to the to the family doctor. So maybe the family doctor would like some kind of talking map or a little reference sheet for how they might have those conversations when, as we said, time is now measured in months, that we're, we're seeing things shift to more of a needing of palliative integration, um, that hospitalizations might be less able to meet the goals of care. If the goals of care are around comfort, then a lot of times in that stage, hospitalization, we know treatment of pneumonia in advanced dementia does not improve um, quality of life. It can extend life, but it doesn't improve the quality. So things like that um, could be maybe important references like that, ways to, to, to have those conversations when you're seeing that a shift, you know, to use the most terminology, might be needing to, or not needing, but you're seeing that it might be important to go from an M3 to M M1 um, for the best um, interests of the, of the resident. So, as I was saying before, you ha we have to be clear. We have to use terms like death, dying, perhaps dying time. We took that from one of our clinical nurse specialists, Della Roberts. Some people find it really helpful to talk about someone's dying time. Oh, well, that makes sense then. If they're in their dying time, of course, then I don't want them to go to the hospital. But if you're still unclear which way that road is going, then you might. And so, unless we're clear. Um, and I think also on that... Uh, talking draft map, talking map. Um, we talked about sharing that the prognosis, we're seeing somebody maybe having months, but also that sense of they're, but they're frail enough to have some, an infection next week could take their life. They need to understand that so that they're not surprised. And the use of um, preemptive discussions, we know what's coming, so you know, you might be wondering, or it's, so we can't always wait for them to ask the question. Sometimes we have to anticipate what they might need to know. So, um, you know, you don't need a crystal ball to know that these things are going to be coming and that sometimes we need to prepare families and talk about it. And they certainly are going to need to support information as, they, as this transition continues. Um, coming back to this, I, I think one of my points is avoiding presenting the illusion of choice, which I think sometimes we do. It's all about, well, what do you want? Do you want to go to hospital? Do you not want to go to hospital? If you don't frame it with all the information they need, it's not um, a real choice, and so I like this one. Damned if you do, damned if you don't, right? Um, so prolonging suffering versus letting them die. And if you're leaving somebody feeling like they're choosing between those two doors. Can you give an example of that? Because I, I give the illusion of choice when I'm asking them, what do you want to do if, you're, if I can't succeed in treating your patients with your own medication? Well, I think it's around uh, establishing the goals. So 
are, are we still really looking to try to prolong life or are we focused on comfort? And then setting up what are realistic. Um, so is X going to help us get there? Um, is a transfer to hospital, is the oral antibiotics going to help us? If we're not sure, if we're also unsure and we're going to, you know, because um, we don't always know, um, then you say, well, we might have a trial and we'll look for this, these kind of improvements. Yeah. So I wanted to refer you to one of the tools uh, that's been uh, developed. And uh, we really, we know you guys are having these conversations. And so we really hesitated. We, we knew that the, that the staff in the residential care um, uh, homes wanted assistance in having conversations. So we developed these talking mats for them. And we're doing some education with them with role playing. And they're reporting that they're, they feel much more comfortable with these conversations. And they feel much more comfortable with communicating with other people. So we hesitated to create this. It's, it's called When Time is Measured in Months, A Conversation Guide Supporting Transition. Okay? And so what I wanted you to refer you to is the second page of this, just based on what you asked. Okay. Can you give me an example? Yeah. Number four says revisit most status. And on there you said give me an example of what I might say to avoid the illusion of choice. Okay? And one of the phrases phrases there might be, you know, asking. We do have this ask, tell, ask frame for so much of our conversations. What are you hopeful for when your mom goes to the hospital? What's the outcome? We want her to be comfortable, right? Is probably what they're going to say. But if you look at the third bullet, it will say something like hospitalizations can be very difficult for people with severe dementia and, and who are very frail because people who have severe dementia are frail. If we, fo if we are focused on comfort care in the last part of her life, a trip to hospital will make things worse or can make things worse and that's reference that's reference to a an article you can see number one um, it's an excerpt from up to date but it's also reference from a new england journal of medicine article on uh, the trajectories of dying in in and i see romaine nodding about that infections and fever are not uncomfortable for people in transition for people who are moving to their dying time if treatment and care are focused on comfort, antibiotics may not be necessary. We can support your mom for a natural, comfortable death here in the facility. So when you say, what can I do to avoid the illusion of choice, that's what we have developed this tool for. And our hope today had been to have some time to look at this in a more fulsome way and maybe, maybe even have a chance for you guys to practice it. But as you can see, there's so much information to share about this project that we have worked so hard on and created all of these tools that we we, we don't we don't want to say that this is not being done that good palliative approach isn't happening in the residential care facilities because we know that it is but but it depends as Romaine and I chatted about just a few minutes ago it depends on the individuals it depends on you guys doing your job it depends on the care aides doing their jobs and the nurses doing their jobs and it depends on, on the families knowing where things are at. So what we're trying to say is, you're doing a good job, but how can we work in a systems way? Please, go ahead. Um, so my experience taught me, I worked for six years in residential care, that actually the people self-select for being some of the most difficult people <laughs> to deal with, right? And I'm talking about patients and families, right? Because they want everything done. That's why they've been, that's why they have died sooner and they've ended up in residential care. So you you've got an uphill battle to start with. Am I right? I mean, no. Yeah. You know what I mean? So people are saying, Oh, well, we'll go back to the hospital. And then the fact that, that in acute care they've said in such they're in such a rush to get so and so out of acute care that they say, Oh yeah, they'll take care of that in residential care. <laughs> They'll be, they'll be rehab in residential care. They'll go be, you know, uh, mm -hmm. heavenly baths and spring showers. <laughs> and so, so you're at a disadvantage, I see. Um, the, the, so it's more difficult. I find some of the most terrible conundrums were there, and it's usually it wasn't the patient, it was the family, mm -hmm. right? And there you're, you know, I see heads nodding, right? Like that's where all the work is. So I find. Um, like sometimes family misunderstood. They didn't know that dying involves getting them dehydrated. So 
They had a family who took their 97-year-old mother back and forth to the hospital. Um, and I realized finally that I that they needed really blunt, blunt words. And nobody had used that. And I said, don't you realize you can't die unless you dry out first? And they said, oh my God, why didn't you tell me that? <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that part of comfort care? Yeah. Yeah. I, I couldn't believe how blunt you know, I was getting. But then on the other hand, you have people who don't really want to hear the word dying. And you have to say end of life, right? Mm -hmm. Like you. But, but you need to get the message across. Um, so I find, and, and you know, quality of life is important for them. It's any little life is important, right? Different values. So I find these incredibly difficult. And I just wanted to support you in the, in the difficulty uh, mm -hmm. with the, so few staff and with so little time. So as part of, as the physician attached here, very often they say, oh, Christine, can you come see this patient? And I go, actually, no, because there's a process that we want to leave behind something that's going to stay. Mm -hmm. So we want to teach them how to reach out, how to talk to the physicians, how to, we're providing education for that stuff so they're more comfortable in giving the PRNs, they're not worried about killing their patient with the opioid, so education. We're trying to provide a, a venue with the palliative care rounds that happen once a month to express their worries, do some point of care education. So that is all part of it and that's what we're going to be trying to leave behind. As well as the collaboration between hospice and, and the facilities so that the nurses know who to call. How do I get help? Um, PRT doesn't go in, but how do I talk to someone to say, it's okay, go ahead, go give a breakthrough, um, call us back. And then we'll walk you through it. Yeah. yeah. Did I? Is that fair? What I just said? Yeah. We're trying to build that relationship yeah. more, and certainly physicians are willing to do consults, and there is a, a consult service so that you guys should Sorry. have. Sorry. Yes. yes. So you would call hospice to call go through the usual channels. You talk to the physician. Shall we get a palliative care uh, consult, or are you able to assist us? And if the physician says yes, please, let's get a physician consult, then the usual channels of getting a palliative care physician. So you call the palliative care unit at, to go through a formal consult request and one of us will come out. But I'm not, I don't want to be walking the halls as part of the project and doing lots of consultations because then that isn't going to really show us what we can leave behind. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So, so not within really the scope of this project, but I do think there is more and more attention to this. I think there's recognition that there are barriers to this approach fully being implemented because of the things you talk about, the staffing ratios and things like that. So even with the ministry mandate to double hospice spaces within the province, they haven't fully done that. And one of the things they're looking at are, could there be community teams that are stronger that could make as needed hospice beds within residential care in a way. And I don't, um, so what supports would need to go in to support that person in a more complex situation um, that, as you say, something like CHF or, or whatnot. But I do think we can do a lot by planning to, to some degree. And I think one of my points that I missed before was, you know, a lot of times in the advanced care conversation, the goals of care conversation, we talk about what we won't do. So the most is kind of focused on that. We're not going to transfer. Not, but you need a plan of what you're going to do then. And it's not just, well, comfort care. If the person has congestive heart failure and they've had a number of admissions, what are we going to do next time there's an exacerbation? Is there a sub Q order of morphine on board? What, what is there for them? Is there a stepwise thing that the nurses can follow to manage those symptoms? Um, it's not good enough to end la um, to just rely on the end of life order set because that's really different, isn't it? It's for when the PPS is twenty percent and they're basically imminently dying, and then you can start something. But if you have something you know is going to happen, just like you would plan for a crisis around a tumor bleed or other things you might plan ahead um, with. So, what are we going to do? Okay, so I have to finish up here. So I was going to say. I'll skip this one then, because I don't have a lot of time. Um, you know, we started this saying that we wanted to look at what how you do palliative care in those final days, and I think really what I what we wanted to say was if you've been doing some of the integration and planning, then hopefully those those that time goes a little bit easier. So just 
We do have the order set within Island Health. It's hopefully helpful in most cases. I'd love feedback on that because that's something that we could potentially tweak as part of this um, if, if it's not always working. Um, you know, we have to be planning for that, that loss of a, the oral route, and there may be special circumstances if they're on high doses of methadone <laughs> or something like that. How are we going to get around that? We've seen that happen and not go so well. Um, potentially, if they have a seizure, just like I'm, most medications, it's okay when they stop swallowing. Are there cases where you'd want to plan um, something else if, uh, if they have a very active seizure disorder or something? Exactly. Yep. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So, I did promise you guys a chance yes. to ask about okay. the order Yes. I have a lot of situations and secretions I've found, because it's my experience with palliative care and residential care. And I know that there's been a lot of debate between glyco versus atropine and whatnot, but can you also just for the family's sake, I find that um, the glyco is more of a healthy patient in mind, you have a healthy death, that one of the biggest things that sticks with family is the way that they're breathing, the way that they sound, and the way that you to tears of when you're talking about the family, it's like, you know, it's not like there's a lot of patients I hear, and they're like, well, I was told, Yes, and I'm, <laughs> I really, it is challenging, and you know, there's not really a lot of good evidence for any of those medications we use. Um, really, I think it's around setting expectations that this is part of the dying process, maybe like becoming dehydrated, and we can make maybe small differences. I think sometimes we're also trying to fix things that aren't upper airway respirations, so things like pneumonias or congestive heart failure that are lower down and that, that glyco is not going to help. So do they actually need some Lasix that they were always on and maybe they need a dose of sub-Q Lasix? Um, so identifying what the actual issue is and then having those conversations. And I, actually, I think the best thing is actually uh, positioning. Is <laughs> The nurses on my unit will say that. <laughs> yeah. I was going to say that glyco doesn't get rid of the stuff yeah. that's already there. there. No. So it only prevents further yeah. stuff. So you have to get rid of the other stuff by either turning them or rousing their yeah. level of consciousness or point of where they swallow. Yeah. So positioning is so important, mm -hmm. um, and and, and oh. making yeah, and and people's expectations. But um, you know, you are treating the family, and so I will go to quite a lot of lengths to try and um, modify that. You know, because you hate it to be their last. Yeah, and, and, and it's and it's like just you know coming from me and my nursing experience. I think that was just my number one thing. So I feel like it's never stressed enough. Is that this whole rattly kind of end of life thing and like you know you, sometimes people with lung cancer and those you know those secreting tumors like it doesn't matter how many times you turn and you flip them it's mm -hmm. never gets any better and I just you know that's just my little thing to pass on is just expressing I, that so I, I think that we try to get a healthy death picture but families of course who aren't embedded in it day in day out don't understand what a healthy death really is and, you know. <laughs> It's so hard. It's a bit of an oxymoron. Yeah. 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 When, I was a, when I was a palliative care resident, I did some research on uh, end-of-life respiratory congestion. Mm -hmm. And and um, and I had that sense, too, that this was very distressing for families. Mm -hmm. But when you actually ask patients, when you do qualitative research on the distress that the respiratory congestion um, creates, it's very much... Here we go again around the conversation mm -hmm. about what to expect. Mm -hmm. Because some patients, the most most interesting thing that I did was actually do the um, oh gosh, uh, the permission for their loved one to be involved in, in the research. But consent. There we go. <laughs> and and the conversation we had was it surprised me. Oh, uh, the nurse told me that there was going to be these sounds and and that. When those sounds came, that meant that death was really close, and that made me feel so much better because I went, okay, now, here we are, I know where we're at. Oh, so, nice. and if you get physicians, in the palliative care physicians who work on research in respiratory congestion, you're going to get arguments about what to do. Mm -hmm. If you go to speak with Dr. Gagnon in Montreal, he'll say, we don't know what the natural history is of respiratory congestion. We don't know if what we're doing makes a difference. Mm -hmm. There's one randomized controlled trial mm -hmm. on the use of atropine and one other medication.
medication, but they did a lousy job of choosing the dose and the delivery. So, uh, so we don't really know whether what we're the, this up and down that we see is because of the medications we're giving or not. Again, the most useful thing we're doing is we're being present, we're describing what we see, we're saying distress, a furrowed brow, there's no furrowed brow, she seems very comfortable, this is a nor this is normal part of dying. What are you most worried about? I'm worried she's uncomfortable. You know, ask, tell, ask. That's mm -hmm. the most important thing. Thank you. I'll take one last question or comments in the back. Just a comment. Uh, I've been working on and off in the diet of care for years as a nurse, and I found a book that I think found was very useful. It's called Journey's End, and it's, it's written by a nurse in Wayne's terms, and the family you get it, they sit there at the bedside reading, and all of a sudden you get it. Oh, this is, this is what happens. Breathing. Thank you. And where do you get copies of it? I don't know when I can find out. I get that information. Mm -hmm. Okay, any other helpful hints or last oh, questions? So thank you so much for coming and fill your evaluation forms. And we'll see you again at our next event. And a big round of applause for the other.